OK, so today, our mathematician spotlight uh, is Amy Wilkinson, who you can see in the picture. She is a professor uh, at the University of Chicago. Um, Amy studies dynamical systems and ergodic theory. We've talked about ergodic theory a little bit before. It's the study of if you have a piece of dough and you throw maybe a little bit of a different kind of dough in there and you knead it for a while, will it get all mixed up or will your other kind of dough just sort of stay all by itself or mix into a small bit? That's the idea of ergodic theory. How well do things get mixed? Another thing that Professor uh, Wilkinson studies is like spaces of surfaces. Spaces of surfaces. What an idea. I thought I'd give you a little idea of what a space of surfaces might be. So when I was in college, I, I had this question. My question was, which is more, which are there more of, acute triangles or obtuse triangles? Reasonable question. Um, so you'd have to find some way to count. So, so which, so are there more? Acute or obtuse triangles? That was my burning question. And so I came up with a way to answer this. So first, I hope you'll agree with me that whether a triangle is big or small doesn't really matter. The angles define a triangle uniquely. So an, a triangle is something where the three angles, let's call the angles x, y, and z, where the three angles add up to 180 degrees. That's a triangle. And you can see this as a plane, the plane x plus y plus z equals 180. So I would draw this as, here's the x-axis, here's the y-axis. Pick the points 180 on each of the axes, and then draw the plane that connects those. Oh yeah, and also I need x, y, and z to be greater than 0. So this triangle, which is the part of this plane that's in the first octant, where everything is positive, represents the space of all possible triangles. So for instance, if you take the middle point, you get the equilateral triangle. So that's like 60, 60, 60. If you take this point right here, this is the point where y is 180 degrees and the other two are 0, right? x and z are both 0. So this is a triangle that looks like, I'm going to draw it not quite, but this is a triangle where this angle is 180 and these two angles are 0. So it's a degenerate triangle. It's actually a flat triangle. But just a little bit in from the corner, you get a triangle that actually looks like this. So this represents the space of all possible triangles. Um, you can find, so you might want to find your favorite kind of triangle. I already found the equilateral triangle. That's right in the middle. Another thing you could try to find is, find is right triangles. So for instance, right here, you have um, x equals y equals 90. Here you have x equals z equals 90. And here you have z equals x equals 90. So these lines, these, the midlines, if you will, of the triangle are the right triangles. So the really powerful idea here is that we have this shape, this, this triangle actually, where each point is not really a point the way we think of it, but each point is actually a triangle. And so if you wanted to answer my burning question, are there more, more acute triangles or obtuse triangles, you could just find the relative areas. So um, these guys on the corner are clearly obtuse, like this. Um, and the right angles separate acuteness from obtuseness. So you can figure out that the obtuse triangles actually live out here. So all the blue parts are obtuse. And then all the acute triangles live in here. So with this measure, there are more obtuse triangles. In fact, they're in a 3 to 1 ratio. Um, and, and the answer to this question depends on how you count. Um, you can come up with a different space of triangles to count them. Uh, but this is, this is one reasonable way of doing it. Um, and I'll just mention one more thing, which is that this picture is, is symmetric. Um, actually, all the information for the picture is uh, in one piece like this. So these pieces are actually all have the same information. So it's 
one sixth of it gives you all of the information that you need for the picture. So you could actually fold this up and identify all the triangles with, you, with each other that give you the same information. And thinking about spaces of surfaces or spaces of triangles and which parts are the same and how it folds up is a big part of the study of that kind of thing. So that's the idea. And I think it's a pretty cool idea that the, the point actually represents a whole triangle and you can quantify things by thinking about areas represent different kinds of triangles. Yeah? Is your question like including the of the triangles? So like you can't use a specific angle twice or something? Yeah, it, so this would, uh, the answer would depend on how you count. So if you're not allowed to use a specific angle twice, then it would be different. But I would say like you can have a 60 degrees, you can use that multiple times. You can use 60, 60, 60, 60, 59, 41, mm -hmm. or whatever, 61. Yeah, you can use the same angle twice. All right, so there's that. Okay, so the last couple of times we've been talking about change of variables. So change of variables to polar coordinates, and then last time a change of variables in general. So t today we'll finish that by talking about integrating in different variables, integrating in 3D integrals in cylindrical and spherical coordinates. So that's the idea of today. Um, and the first thing we'll do is we'll do just one more example of a change of variables. So our first example is let's compute the double integral of the function x squared plus y squared times e to the x squared minus y squared dv over the region r, which is as follows. So. First, let's take the uh, hyperbola xy equals 1, and also the hyperbola xy equals 4, so that those hyperbolas have the axes as asymptotes. And now let's think about some hyperbolas that have y equals x and y equals negative x as asymptotes. Let's think about, let's use um, x squared minus y squared equals 1, and x squared minus y squared equals 9. OK, so our region R is the region bounded by those four curves in the first quadrant. So that's the setup. So let's compute this. OK, so the first example we did on Monday was like a polynomial over a nice region, and you could have set it up. This one, kind of a mess. If we wanted to set it up, we'd probably have to break it into several regions, three regions. If we did vertical uh, slices and also three regions if we did horizontal slices, and then integrate the, this thing looks like a huge mess. So we hope, we hope change of variables will help. Because at this point, it's our it's the, it's the only tool we have left to work with. Now, I learned recently that you're not supposed to hope because you just live in the moment and not hope. But maybe it will work, and then our life will be better in a, in a moment than it was now. OK, so let's try. So looking at, at the region and its boundaries, it kind of looks like a rectangle. In fact, my curves weren't that curvy, so it really kind of looks like a rectangle. So we wish that we could have like u as our vertical and horizontal-ish boundaries and v as our other boundaries. So let's try that. So let's try the change of variables where u is, gives us these boundaries. So u is x, y, and where v gives us the other boundaries. So x squared minus y squared. Let's try that. Maybe it will work. So then uh, the double integral over r of x squared plus y squared times e to the negative, nope, positive x squared minus y squared dv is the integral from v equals, oh, let's see, what do our variables? So u goes from 1 to 4, and v goes from 1 to 9. OK, now we can set this up. 
So v goes from 1 to 9, u goes from 1 to 4, and then we have our function x squared plus y squared. We'd like to have that in terms of u and v. What a mess. Well, hopefully we can figure out something to do. Let's just put it in as x squared plus y squared for now, and we'll just remember that we have to do something with it. Okay, now e to the, oh, v, that's good. And then we have to multiply by the Jacobian expansion factor, and then d u d v. Okay, so we just need the Jacobian expansion factor to, fi to finish this up. Okay, so the Jacobian expansion factor is the determinant of the matrix of partials of x, y with respect to partials of u and v. Um, this is a matrix that tells you how areas change when you go when you do one of the tr one of the transformations. In order to do this, compute this matrix. We have to have x as a function of u and v, and y as a function of u and v. This sounds like a fun problem. Here, let's do it. Let's solve for x and y as functions of u and v. Well, it's not so easy, actually. It looks like a mess. Um, but what we can do is we can realize that if we find the determinant of the transformation, to find the determinant of the transformation in one direction, we can find the determinant of the inverse transformation and take one over that. Um, the idea is, let's suppose that this transformation multiplies areas by two. Well, then its inverse mu transformation multiplies areas by one half. So we can get that one half number and then take its reciprocal. That's the idea. So we're going to do the, do the uh, inverse, so partials of uv over partials of xy, and then take one over it. In this case, this negative 1 power, this is a number. It's a determinant. So this negative 1 power just means 1 over it, the reciprocal. But I'm not doing 1 over because it, it would be a weird looking fraction. So let's do that. Let's compute that. So that's the absolute value of the determinant of the partial derivatives of the u's and v's with respect to the x and y's. OK, so partial of u with respect to x is y. And partial of u with respect to y is x. And partial of v with respect to x is 2x. And partial of v with respect to y is negative 2y. Awesome. OK? So this is the absolute value of negative 2y squared minus 2x squared. And since x squared and y squared are always positive, this is just 2x squared plus 2y squared. Maybe I should have written those in the other order for clarity. 2y squared plus 2x squared, which is 2 times x squared plus y squared. OK. OK, so let's put that in. This is our Jacobian expansion factor. Jacobian expansion factor. So it is 2 times x squared plus y squared. Oh, 1 over. Great. So this is this part, good point. And then we, so this tells us that partial xy over partial uv is 1 over 2 times x squared plus y squared. So this is not our Jacobian expansion factor. This one is our Jacobian expansion factor. Very nice. OK, so 1 over. Ha! Much better. Whew. Because now, this pesky x squared plus y squared that we didn't know what to do with goes away. Boom. Maybe I should write this so it looks like a fraction. OK, 1 over 2 times x squared plus y squared. Boop. OK, so this leaves us with um, a, an integral that's actually not so bad. So we're going from v equals 1 to v equals 9, from u equals 1 to u equals 4 of 1 half e to the v du dv. And that we can do. It's, it's two steps. It's easy to integrate 1 half. It's easy to integrate e to the v. Uh, I believe we get, what do we get? 3 halves 
times e to the ninth minus e to the one. So, of course, it was carefully set up so that our change of variables would work out nicely. Um, but this Im integral that was impossible uh, became actually quite possible. Um, but, yeah, by changing to uh, convenient coordinates for our problem. Yeah. Questions or ideas? Okay, okay, so these coordinates, u equals x, y, and v equals x squared minus y squared, um, were very convenient for this problem. Uh, when you have round things, you want to use cylindrical and spherical coordinates. Um, and you might want to do triple integrals. Okay, so we've been talking about these um, Jacobian area expansion factors. But in three dimensions, our expansion factor is a volume expansion factor. So if you have a two by two matrix, and you take its determinant, that tells you what areas are multiplied by. So it's a, like an area expansion factor. Whereas if you have a three by three matrix, and you take its determinant, that tells you what volumes are multiplied by. So it's a volume expansion factor. So let's uh, compute uh, the Jacobian uh, volume expansion factor. of uh, three by three matrices for cylindrical and spherical coordinates. So we'll just compute these once and then you can use them. You won't have to do, you won't have to come up with your own change of variables in three dimensions. You'll just have to go back and forth between rectangular, cylindrical, and spherical. So let's do it. Okay, so first let's start with cylindrical coordinates. So x, y, and z in terms of cylindrical coordinates. Well, x is r cos theta, y is r sine theta, and z is z. Okay? So let's see. Let's compute it. So the partial matrix of x, y, and z with respect to the variables r, theta, and z. This is the determinant of a big matrix. So the partial of x with respect to r, the partial of x with respect to theta, and the partial of x with respect to z. Then the next line is the partial of y with respect to r, partial of y with respect to theta, and partial of y with respect to z. And the last line is partial of z with respect to r, partial of z with respect to theta, partial of z with respect to z. Okay, we'll compute this one and we won't do the one for spherical coordinates. Okay, let's do it. So, that's the determinant of the matrix. Okay, partial of x with respect to r is cos theta. Partial of x with respect to theta, negative r sine theta. And partial of x with respect to z, well, there are no z's in it at all, so zero. Okay, and then similarly for y, the uh, partial of y with respect to r is sine theta, partial of y with respect to theta is r cos theta, and partial of y with respect to z, z is zero, partial of z with respect to x and y, or to, partial of z with respect to r and theta is zero, because there are no thetas or r's, and with respect to z itself is one. Okay, so we get this matrix. Now, we have to take the determinant of this matrix. It is a three by three matrix. So you have learned to do this. Uh, there, there's a, a clever trick that involves like lines all the way across and all the way back. Uh, but for this one, maybe cofactor expansion is the best. So if we cofactor expand across the last column, we would be taking zero times the determinant of this matrix. Who knows what it is, whatever, it's zero times something. Minus zero times the determinant of this matrix, okay? Doesn't matter, that's also zero. Plus one times the determinant of this matrix. So maybe I'll, so one times the determinant of this matrix. Um, and this is actually a matrix, this little two by two here is a matrix we've seen before. This was the matrix we used for polar coordinates to find the area expansion factor. So it actually shouldn't be too surprising that the volume expansion factor for 
um, cylindrical coordinates is going to come out as the same as the area expansion for polar, because cylindrical is just polar with z. Okay, and we have found that this is, let's see, negative r, I believe. Okay, so it's the absolute value, let's see, r, cosine theta, okay, maybe it's absolute value of r, and since r is positive, that's just r. So this tells us, tells us that dv is r dz dr d theta. So in particular that our Jacobian expansion factor is r for cylindrical coordinates. Yeah? You can play around with the order. This is multiplication. It's actual multiplication, so you can do it in whatever order you want. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, let's do this for also for, for spherical coordinates. So for spherical coordinates, we need x, y, and z in terms of rho, phi, and theta. So I remember that z is rho cos phi. I think that's right. Um, well, I remember it from an hour ago, but also I can draw it in here. So let's see if we have some point that we want to find its coordinates. Our, um, radi our distance from the origin is rho. Our angle down from the z-axis is phi. So if we put our point, shadow of our point somewhere, the z-coordinate of this point is hypotenuse times cosine of phi. Okay, so z is rho cosine of phi. And then this distance here, which we could call r, is rho sine of phi. And then to get the x, if the x-axis is somewhere, to get the x and the y, uh, we do r cos theta and r sine theta. So it's this r times cos theta and this r times sine theta. So that I could have just written down the spherical coordinates for x, y, and z, but I thought we'd rederive it so you remember that it's not like a mystery. It comes from somewhere. So um, if you write down the matrix of derivatives, so we want to compute the partial derivatives of x, y, and z with respect to rho, phi, and theta, uh, you would get a whole box of derivatives like this, the same kind of thing. You would take them all, and then you'd find the determinant. Okay? And the answer is, it comes out to, you're taking the absolute value of rho squared sine phi. So now we have to decide, is this rho squared sine phi, is it negative rho squared sine phi, what is it going to be? So we should look at our picture. So rho squared, we all, that's a positive number, so rho squared is always positive, or, or zero. Um, and then sine phi, well we know that phi is between zero and pi, because it comes from the north pole, positive z-axis, all the way down, pointing toward the south pole, negative z-axis, so that's pi worth of angle. Um, and if you look at the unit circle, if we, our angle phi is between 0 and pi, the y values are always positive. So sine of phi is always positive. Or 0. So it tells us that this part is always positive, and this part is always positive, so we can remove the absolute value signs. So this tells us that this is rho squared sine phi. So the takeaway message here is that dv is rho squared sine phi d rho d phi d theta. Yeah. So the idea of what this means is that in rho phi theta space, you have some little box, some little rectangular box with width d rho, length d phi, height d theta and then you map it into xyz space and it gets curved, for sure, according to these equations. And you want to know what happens to the volume of this little box in rho phi theta space when you go up, take it into xyz space. And the answer is, well, it depends where you are, it depends what your rho is and what your phi is, and it gets multiplied by this amount. It's so stretched, yeah. But the volume of the object doesn't change between variables or between different coordinate systems, right? Like if it's 9, 
somewhere in the rectangular coordinates. If we change it to polar coordinates, we should also get a point of an area of Nine, right? Yeah, if, so if you, if you write something in one coordinate system and you change it to other coordinates, you want to get the same answer in both because the volume of the object doesn't change. But the, like the, the volume of the region that you're integrating over might look very different. So for instance, if you're um, integrating over a sphere, if you wrote a sphere in XYZ coordinates, it would have a bunch of square roots and stuff in it. If you wrote it in rho phi theta coordinates, Theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, phi goes from 0 to pi, rho goes from 0 to some constant, which is a box. It's actually a rectangular box in rho phi theta coordinates, which is kind of a crazy idea. So it, it, the shape is different, and that's why we have to multiply by this adjustment factor. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, why is the Jacobian expansion factor not dependent on theta? Um, let's see. Hmm. Yeah, it seems like if it depends on phi, it should also depend on theta. Uh, I cannot think off the top of my head what the geometric reason is. But remind me and I'll think about it and get back to you. Good question. Can anybody think of a reason why? It should not depend on f theta, but it does depend on phi? OK, we will remember and come back. We will think about it. Good question. OK, so these, exp these volume expansion factors are supposed to help you do triple integrals. So we should try it out on the simplest triple integrals and see if it works, just to make sure that it works. So anytime you get a new thing, you try it to make sure it works, right? Your new, your new thing that you buy at the store, you turn it on to see if it works. Let's turn this air expansion, volume expansion factor on to see if it works. So let's see, let's compute the volume of a solid ball, let's call it B, of radius big R. Um, I'm calling it big R because our variable is little r. So let's first do it in cylindrical coordinates. Okay, so here is our solid ball of radius r. So our radius is r. And we want to uh, do this in cylindrical coordinates. So we want theta to go from something to something, r to go from something to something, and z to go from something to something. OK, let's set up to integrate this. Oh, we want to compute the volume. So we just want to compute 1 dv. So we want to compute 1 times dv. And for cylindrical coordinates, dv is r dz dr d theta. So r dz dr d theta. OK, so to integrate over this region, theta, we want it to go all the way around. So theta should go from 0 to 2 pi. R we want it to go from the center of the ball out to the outside. So r should go from 0 up to our big constant r. Oh, by the way, I could have put this ball anywhere, but it's easiest to center it at the origin. So let's center it at the origin. And then z. OK, so given any, any r and theta here, r comma theta, you have some z coming in from negative z. It pierces into the sphere, or into the ball. It stays in for a while, and then it pops out. So we want to know when does it pop in, and when does it pop out as a function of r and theta. That's, that's the goal, to know this. So let's draw in a little right triangle here. So the hypotenuse of this right triangle is r, assuming the point is on the sphere. The, the, the bottom leg is small r. And the height is z. So if we pull this thing out, we have big R, little r, and z. So little z squared plus little r squared equals big R squared. z squared equals big R squared minus little variable r squared. So z equals plus or minus the square root of big R squared minus little r squared. OK? So what do you think? Will you want mi minus or plus? Both. 
Down here, z pops in at negative square root of big R squared minus little r squared, and it pops out at positive square root of big R squared minus little r squared. OK, so let's fill those in. z goes in at negative square root of big R squared minus little r squared, and pops out at big R squared minus little r squared. OK. Yeah, question? I'm confused by the big R and the little r. I don't know the difference and like the r that we're integrating with respect to, which one is it, the big r or the small r? Well, so the difference between the little r and the big r is that little r is our variable, and big r is like the radius of our sphere. So I could have said, find the volume of a solid ball of radius 4, and then everywhere you see a big r, you'd replace it with a 4. But I wanted to get the formula for the volume of a sphere in general of radius r. So uh, you could, should consider a big r to be a constant. So if you wanted a ball of radius 4, and she wanted a ball of radius 2.5, right? We just want to use big R. It works for everything. OK. So if you were to compute this, let's just do one step. So on the outside, we get theta equals 0 to 2 pi. Then we get from R equals 0 to whatever our big radius is. The integral of R dz is R times z. And then we plug in from z equals negative this thing to positive this thing. So we get r, 2r. Oh yeah, because these together make 2. So 2r times the square root of big R squared minus little r squared uh, dr d theta. And this is possible to compute. Often it's not possible to compute the integral of a square root because you don't have the derivative of the inside on the outside. But here the derivative of the inside is negative 2r, which we do have on the outside. So it's going to work out. We can do it. Um, and I'll, I'll miss, skip the steps, um, but we do get, we get 2 pi from the, the theta going from 0 to 2 pi, and we'll get 2 thirds pi times big R cubed from the r integral, so we'll get 4 thirds pi r cubed, which is indeed the volume of a sphere. So I, I, did, I skipped these steps um, because I happen to know we will need time to do other things, but it will, it will work out. Yeah. Ah! You're so right. Yes, great. There's no additional pi. Yeah, good. So 2 pi from the theta and 2 thirds r cubed from this square root thing, where would a pi come from? Nowhere. So 4 thirds pi r cubed. So this tells us that we should have at least a bit of confidence in our cylindrical uh, Jacobian volume expansion factor. It seems to work. OK. Let's try spherical. OK, so the same question. So find the volume of a solid ball B of radius big R, whatever you want. So uh, now in spherical coordinates. So we want to find the triple integral over B of 1 dv which is going to be some kind of spherical integral of 1 dv. And in spherical coordinates, dv is rho squared sine phi, that's the Jacobian area expansion factor, volume expansion factor, d rho, d phi, d theta. OK, now it's just up to us to set up the limits of integration. Theta goes from something to something. Phi goes from something to something. Rho goes from something to something. Let's do it. So again, we have our ball. And its radius is still r. OK, so for theta, we want to go all the way around. So theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. For phi, we want to go all the way from the top to the bottom. So phi goes from 0 to pi. And then for rho, we want our radius, the radio we're thinking about, to go from the origin, when rho equals 0, all the way out to the outside, when rho equals big R. So there you go. 
Okay? And this one I think will actually do. So I mentioned the other day, but I'm not sure that I did an example, that when um, all of your variables are kind of separate, you can compute the integral separately. So notice that all of our limits of integration are constants, including this big R, it's a constant. And then all of our functions are functions of only one of the variables. So we can break this up into three integrals. This is from theta equals zero to two pi. Let's collect all the theta things, just d theta, times, let's do the phi integral, phi equals zero to pi of all the phi things. So sine phi, d phi, times the rho integral. So rho goes from zero up to big R of all the rho things. So rho squared d rho. Um, and if you did these all together, like the Russian nesting dolls, inside, a little bit out, a little bit out, um, you would be doing the same things. You just carry along the constants that you got from the first one, multiply that by the second one, and so on. So let's try this. So the integral of just one d theta from zero to two pi is two pi. Okay. This one, the antiderivative of sine phi. Negative cosine, yeah? Negative cosine of phi. Okay, from phi equals zero to phi equals pi. Okay, we'll have to compute that. And the antiderivative of rho cubed, uh, sorry, is rho squared, dramatic foreshadowing, is rho cubed over three. And we'll do that from rho equals zero to rho equals big R. Okay, let's compute equals these, two, these three things. So this first one is two pi. This one is negative negative one minus one comes out to two minus plus two. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Comes out to two, good. And this last one is rho cubed over three, uh, oh, r cubed over three. So it comes out to triumphantly four pi r cubed over three. Yes. Four pi r cubed over three. Which I see Charlie checking is the same thing we got before, which we that time we just said that was right. So yes, it worked. Yay. So we again got the volume of a sphere. Okay, I have one more question. Before your question, I have one question. Which, one, which way was easier, cylindrical coordinates or spherical coordinates? Yeah, spherical, because it was just these three separate things, yeah? So it reminds us that spherical coordinates are well suited to spheres. Cylindrical coordinates are okay suited to spheres, better than rectangular, but not quite as easy. Okay, question. Variable. That's right. We may not have split up our integrals like this. That's right. So if any of our limits of integration weren't constants, if they were functions of other variables, you'd have to keep those together. Okay. So for example, over in cylindrical coordinates, we could have taken the theta integral out and done it separately, but the z integral depended on r. So we'd have to have a theta integral times an r and z integral because they depend on each other. And similarly, if you have a function, if your function was like e to the power theta times r times z, it involved all of them, you couldn't split it up because your function is of all the variables. Yeah. Yeah, other questions or ideas? Okay. Okay, so the last thing we'll do is set up um, integrals in cylindrical and spherical over a different region. Okay, not a sphere. So we will use the ice cream cone region. So we, let's take um, a sphere. This is the sphere that's centered at zero, zero, 001. So it's sitting on top of the xy plane. And then let's take the cone, the standard cone, z equals square root of x squared plus y squared. So that's like at a 45 degree angle. So this cone. Okay, and then we will let the ice cream cone be the region between. So this is the plane between them. Uh, the cone, ice cream cone, is this bottom part. Okay, and the ice cream is this sphere top part. Okay. Okay, so 
our question is to integrate f of x, y, z equals x times z. You can think of that as being like the temperature or the tastiness at each point inside the ice cream cone over the uh, region, ice cream cone region C between the sphere x squared plus y squared plus z minus 1 squared equals 1 and the cone z equals squared of x squared plus y squared. So the entire orange and green, uh, yellow and green region. Okay, this is our quest. Okay. So let's set this up in various coordinate systems. So let's first do cylindrical. In the order dz, dr, d theta. So the triple integral over c of x times z dv. That's what we want. So we'll set this up as a triple integral in cylindrical. OK, so x times z in cylindrical. x is like r cos theta, z is z. And then dv is r dz dr d theta. OK, so there's our integrand. Now we have to set up our limits of integration. OK, so we have theta, r, and z. OK, so for theta, we want to go all the way around. So theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. For r, we could, so our shadow plane for this thing is the r theta plane. So we want to set up integrating over the shadow of this ice cream cone in the r theta plane. And so it's over a disk of this radius, which is 1 goes all the way to the side. OK, so this has radius 1. So r goes from 0 up to 1. And now let's figure out z. So our th shadow plane is the r theta plane. So for any point here, r theta, that we pick in our shadow region, we take z going from negative infinity. And it comes up, it comes up, it goes through our point. It pierces into the solid somewhere. It stays in for a while. And then it pierces out somewhere else. And so we want to know, where, what is the in-z and the out-z? So it looks like it comes in here on the cone, and it comes out here on the sphere. So we need to solve the cone equation and the sphere equation for z. So let's do the sphere equation first, because it's here on the left. So we would get z minus 1 squared. Oh, wait. x and y. How useless to us. We are in cylindrical. We need r. So x squared plus y squared. r squared. OK, r squared plus z minus 1 squared equals 1. So z minus 1 squared equals 1 minus r squared. z minus 1 equals plus or minus the square root of 1 minus r squared. z equals 1 plus or minus the square root of 1 minus r squared. OK, which one do we want, do you think? The plus, yeah, because we're on the top of the sphere. OK, so we want the plus. So that's what this one is. z equals 1 plus square root of 1 minus r squared. So that goes up here. z equals 1 plus square root of 1 minus r squared. OK? And that's where it pops out. Let's see where it pops in. It pops in on the cone. The cone equation in cylindrical coordinates is just z equals r, yeah? So it pops in at z equals r. OK. Um, if you like, you could split this up, because the theta integral is just constants, and this cos theta just depends on theta. So you could split this up. This is the integral from theta equals 0 to 2 pi of cos theta d theta. And how about the rz integral? We cannot split them up because the z depends on r. So we have to multiply by the integral from r equals 0 to 1, the integral from z equals r to z equals 1 plus square root of 1 minus r squared of all this stuff. r squared z dz dr. OK, but this one, you integrate cos theta from 0 to 2 pi. 
you get zero. Yeah, because cos theta, it's, it's the sinusoidal function with period 2 pi. So the area above equals the area below. So this part is zero times whatever this is, some finite amount, finite. So this is zero. Um, yeah. OK, so the average tastiness of our ice cream is zero. So sad. OK, um, let's just try to do this in spherical coordinates. Oh, already labeled, so convenient. So for spherical coordinates, we're trying to, again, take the triple integral over the cone of x, z, dv. So x in spherical coordinates is like rho sine phi cos theta. And z, gosh, this is going to be a long one, is uh, rho cos phi. So this is the x, this is the z. And then we need dv, rho squared sine phi d rho d phi d theta. Whew, what a thing. We know it's going to come out to 0, but OK. So this is our dv. And now we need to set this thing up. Theta, again, goes from 0 to 2 pi, because we want to go all the way around. How about phi? Can you figure out which phi's you would want for this ice cream cone? From the z-axis, we want to go from the z-axis down to there. Yeah, pi over 4, because this cone is at a 45 degree angle. 45 degrees is pi over 4. So phi goes from 0 up to pi over 4. And now we need rho. So rho, for any, any given um, phi and theta, you have a, a thing like piercing through, and then it comes out there. So certainly, you start at rho equals 0, but then we want to know, what rho, what rho do we pop out at? So we need to do a bit of algebra for that. So if we start at rho equals some, at 0, and we go to something. So this one is a bit clever. Hmm. OK, what's the trick here? Let's see. This is x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus 2z plus 1 equals 1. So we can simplify this to x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 2z. x squared plus y squared plus z squared? Rho squared. 2z is 2 rho uh, cos phi. I think that's right. And now we have a row on both sides. Row is not equal to 0, where, where we are interested in it, so we can cancel out. Row equals 2 cos phi. So that tells you actually that for this whole this sphere that I drew at the beginning, the equation of the whole thing is row equals 2 cos phi. So that is where row pops out. Row pops out at 2 cos phi. So row here goes up to 2 cos phi. And that was a bit of a trick to have that idea, to solve for it like that. Uh, but it, it works out, and you can set it up this way. Yeah. Question? Yeah. Don't you have like, stopped at setting up the theta integral um, and not even set up the, the rho and the phi because you can take out the cosine theta, um, integrate it from 0 to 2 pi, and that's also 0, so it doesn't really matter. Yes, so we could have, since we knew that we had a cos theta and we knew theta went from 0 to 2 pi, we could have pulled the theta integral out and known that it came out to theta. Uh, however, the purpose of the exercise was to set it up, so we set it up. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>